Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Prasant Mohapatra. I'm the Vice Chancellor for Research at UC Davis. It is my pleasure to welcome everyone to our exciting program this morning as a part of the Lung Center Carol C. Cross Visiting Professor and Distinguished Speaker Series in Research and Innovation. Today's event is a part of the robust collaboration between the UC Davis Office of Research and the School of Medicine that in many ways flourished in response to the COVID-19 pandemic, bringing together research teams and experts from across the disciplines and schools at UC Davis to find innovative ways to unite in our battle against the pandemic. One prominent example of this is UC Davis Novel's deployment of asymptotic COVID-19 testing and our community partnership with the Healthy Davis Together, which has kept our students and community safe and has put UC Davis in the national spotlight for our innovation and collaboration. This spirit of collaboration has yielded tremendous results with nearly $36 million in COVID-19 research funding at UC Davis since the beginning of pandemic across the School of Medicine, School of Veterinary Medicine, Engineering, and many other programs. This speaker series is a part of UC Davis Office of Research and School of Medicine's desire to feature innovators and groundbreaking scientists who are changing the world. We are pleased that you can join us today in this exciting program. Now, it is my distinct pleasure to introduce my colleague, the Dean of UC Davis School of Medicine, Alison Brescio. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Vice Chancellor Mahapta. We are uh, just uh, delighted with the success of this series. Um, as you noted, the level of collaboration and dedication and innovation at the School of Medicine at all of our partners across UC Davis has truly been inspiring and resulting in amazing achievements during the pandemic. Not only did UC Davis treat the first known case of community acquired COVID-19 in the nation last February, but we've been at the forefront of clinical trials for COVID treatments and vaccines, including the Pfizer mRNA vaccine. As a neurologist and researcher, I'm a strong believer in the importance of academic medical institutions and multidisciplinary research in discovering life-saving treatments and healthcare innovations. As one of the country's leading medical schools, ranking seventh in the nation for training primary care, the heart of our mission is to provide everyone with the best patient-centered care and overall health. Our groundbreaking research is vital to making that possible. And now it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Angela Haksu, the UC Davis School of Medicine Associate Dean for Translational Research and Director of the Lung Biology Center and Dr. Satya Danikar, Professor of Microbiology and Chair of the Department of Medical Microbiology and Immunology at UC Davis School of Medicine. Dr. Haksu will introduce Dr. Carrico. Thank you, Dean Brashir, and thank you, Vice Chancellor Mohapatra for your opening remarks. It is my absolute privilege to introduce our distinguished guest, Dr. Katalin Carrico. Little did I know when uh, she and I were colleagues at UPenn that um, Katie would do what all clinical uh, researchers and scientists only dream of doing, making discoveries that would save lives by the million. Dr. Kariko is Senior Vice President at BioNTech RNA Pharmaceuticals and Associate Professor at the Perelman School of Medicine at the University of Pennsylvania, where she served for 24 years. For the past four decades, her research was focused on developing mRNA and mRNA-mediated mechanisms with the ultimate goal of um, making um, therapy, uh, replacement um, protein, and uh, vaccine development. Dr. Carico is the co-inventor of um, mRNA-related patents for application of non-immunogenic nucleoside-modified RNA. She also co-founded and from 2006 and to, to 2013 served as the CEO 
of RNAx, a company dedicated to developing nucleoside modified mRNA for therapies. She's a founding member of the International mRNA Health Conference, an annual nonprofit meeting for advancements of mRNA technology inaugurated in 2013. Her patent, co-invented with Drew Weissman on nucleoside-modified uridines in mRNA, is used to create the anti-SARS-CoV-2 mRNA vaccines, utilized both by the Moderna and the Pfizer vaccines. It is my greatest honor to welcome our extraordinary guest, Dr. Katalin Kariko. Katie, you are still muted. I haven't seen a word yet. I tried to set up my computer here to share the screen. So Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, you Andrew, for this uh, intra nice introduction. I remember uh, fondly those uh, days when we did it together messenger RNA therapy to the lung. <laughs> and um, I am very happy to be here. and. Uh, um, UC Davis, as we just heard, was participating in the uh, clinical trial of the Pfizer vaccine. And um, I am also very grateful all of the volunteers who participated in this program. So uh, I am here today to talk to you about development of the uh, development of mRNA for, for therapy. And um, oops. So first of all, messenger RNA was discovered in 1961. And 1961 was a very exciting uh, time because uh, actually on that year also uh, genetic code for two first amino acid was solved. That was the phenylalanine and the proline. And 1961, the space race and space age started because uh, Gagarin was, went around once in the but in our field, this was a very exciting time. What happened is that uh, people, um, scientists realized that um, uh, how could it be that a uh, cell would know what kind of protein to make when all of the information is in, in the chromosome, under on the, on the DNA. Uh, oops. And, um, and the translation actually happening in, in the cytoplasm. And they found in a ribosome that there is an RNA. And at the beginning, they thought that maybe this is the RNA, but turned out that it was ribosomal RNA and it was for every cell, it was the same. And uh, it was the size of the same, so it couldn't be. So just like for the, the uh, Mendelian system, they suspected there has to be one RNA, something which uh, some information is coming out. And this is when actually discovered that there is a uh, messenger RNA is produced from the chromosome and um, it uh, comes out from the nuclei and in the ribosome it translated to a protein. And this uh, publication came out in actually 60 years ago, 1961, and both paper uh, stated that uh, this was a very unstable uh, molecule, the RNA, which is coming and carrying the information to, uh, to the ribosome, what kind of protein has to be made. So many times, you know, this unstable uh, characteristic was uh, something that uh, even later, years and years later, you know, made it uh, difficult to introduce to the uh, therapy. But it was 1961, and uh, when we could first time make mRNA in vitro, it was 1984. So what happened during these 20 plus years? First of all, uh, the technology had to be, the molecular biology had to be uh, advanced. So plasmid was introduced and uh, many other uh, features. What, uh, but for this one, for our mRNA was most important that uh, scientists couldn't find uh, RNA polymerase, which they could generate 
in vitro RNA. So they tried uh, uh, bacterial and uh, eukaryotic uh, RNA polymerases, but none of them worked up until uh, scientist uh, Douglas Melton and Paul Krieg uh, published this finding a uh, phage RNA polymerase, sp6 RNA polymerase, which could uh, translate uh, transcribe very well and uh, from the plasmid and the uh, sp6 promoter here is you know just a 17 base pair uh, sequence and so it's very small and very uh, physical so the first uh, rna actually what they made it was uh, uh, coded for uh, interferon beta and uh, bernard morse gave them uh, the captain enzyme who work in an NIH and work on the vaccine project, so they had a lot of help. And then they made a capped uh, RNA, which had poly ATL and uh, five prime, three prime UTR, in addition to the coding sequence. To find out that whether the RNA, what they made, is functional, what they did, they injected to frog oocyte. In the 1984, that was the way to introduce an <clears throat> mRNA inside the cell, and the frog oocyte is large, so that with a needle it could be injected. And uh, then they injected like 20 uh, such uh, oocytes and incubated, and they uh, collected the medium and tested out whether the medium contains functional uh, human interferon. And then they found, yes, it was. It was functional. So this is uh, 1984 when we can start and saying that, yes, uh, messenger RNA uh, uh, therapy can start. But of course, you know, this is not feasible, micro-injecting uh, to cells, because for that one, you need huge cells. So uh, for me, uh, the next milestone is really uh, 1989, when uh, mRNA delivery by lipofectin was solved. So in an, uh, that time, uh, T7 RNA uh, polymerase was the favorite uh, uh, phage polymerase, which people used. It was introduced uh, one year after the uh, sp6 polymerase was used. And, um, and uh, uh, also, instead of enzyme, this was that time it was not uh, available capping uh, enzyme, it was the cap uh, analog was used. It was also um, important uh, because this uh, lipofectin, because um, uh, people before lipofectin, and I worked with RNA in uh, Hungary, but those were not messenger RNA, short RNA, then those um, could be on only introduced to the cell with uh, uh, osmotic shock or calcium phosphate co-precipitation, something which is uh, medically is not feasible, only on cultured cells we could uh, subject such a, a severe treatment. But lipofectin was very mild. A lipofectin uh, actually is a positively uh, cationic liposome, positively charged. And you have to know that uh, the RNA is negatively charged and the cell surface membrane is also negatively charged. So if we put the RNA to the cell, it's not getting in. So, so lipofectin uh, was introduced actually uh, with Phil Fagner introduced in 1987. And uh, it was also very important that um, in, in that second part of the 80s, you can see that so many things happening because uh, here, for example, the uh, uh, triazole was introduced, and those people who struggle with isolating RNA, you know, this um, uh, field, Chomch the Chomchinsky introduced this uh, method. It's very simplified how we could make RNA. Otherwise, it was very tedious and very many times ended up with degraded RNA. So, for this uh, second part of the um, 80s, also so characteristic that some scientists at the bench discovered something and immediately was commercial available. So that like you know, the trisor reagent or the lipofectin or the RNA polymerase, because in the same year when it was published by um, uh, Douglas, um, uh, Melton Douglas, uh, Douglas Melton, sorry, um, that it was already, uh, companies already were selling it. So it was um, very easy. It was also very important that um, uh, the second part of the 80s, already tech DNA polymerase was available and uh, was the molecule of the year in 1989, and we could buy PCR machines. So all of a sudden, if you had a cell which expressed the interest of protein, you just could, uh, sitting at the bench, 
you know, at the laboratory, and then you could uh, make the RNA, you could uh, generate and analyze in uh, different cells. It was like so empowering that uh, if, if you lived in that era, you just can felt like you are a woman, you can do anything. And so it was, um, that's how it happened that uh, it, it was this time, 1989, I went to Penn and um, my colleague was interested in urokinase uh, receptor. And uh, so um, Elliot Barnathan uh, and together we decided to make a messenger RNA therapy. What was interesting is that um, the urokinase uh, receptor was a highly um, uh, post-translational modified uh, uh, protein needed a GPI anchor and highly glycosylated. And uh, to our biggest surprise, when we put this uh, mRNA, this urokinase mRNA to the cell, with lipopectin, we found that a functional uh, receptor was made. And um, we uh, together try to use for different um, uh, application. And um, from cardiology, I moved on to neurosurgery. And there again, using different mRNA coding for uh, nitric oxide synthase, for example, where, you know, not the protein, but the uh, generated VS product was uh, functional and tried to use for uh, fighting uh, vasoconstriction. So all of these experiment led to that uh, we can do any kind of mRNA and we can use it for treatment. And um, so very exciting time, but uh, all of a sudden in 1998, I learned that the RNA, this in vitro transcribed RNA is immunogenic. And this has happened because um, through Weissman arrived Penn from uh, Fauci's lab and um, I met him and he was interested to develop um, HIV vaccine. And uh, I uh, told him that I can make RNA and he was interested to test out because um, uh, he was using uh, plasmids and it didn't work very well on human dendritic cells. And um, when he tested uh, this RNA I gave him, he was uh, very happy that uh, this is the perfect uh, uh, vaccine because not only coding for the uh, uh, antigen, but it is also like an, worked as an adjuvant because it uh, induced uh, uh, immune response. And uh, how happy he was, I was so disappointed and uh, so sad because for 10 years almost, I was working to make a therapeutic uh, protein, uh, mRNA coding for a therapeutic protein. And all of a sudden it turns out that uh, it is uh, immunogenic. And uh, I have to tell you that we are here in 2000. And uh, at 2000, none of the um, none of the RNA sensors were identified. The first one was toll like receptor three and it was uh, discovered in 2001. So we didn't know at all that um, is, is um, why the messenger RNA we are making would be immunogenic. And uh, we know that in our body, we have a messenger RNA and they are not immunogenic, but of course they are coming out from the nuclei. And, um, and what we are doing, we are uh, delivering the RNA from outside of the cells. And so concluded that most likely these um, uh, cells uh, recognizing as a foreign material. And maybe this is why generating such an immune response. And um, so I don't have the whole afternoon to tell you that how many things we tried, but uh, then we come to the conclusion that um, maybe we should uh, test out uh, whether um, the RNA, which is inside the cell, and we can isolate back and put it again to the immune cell, whether this is immunogenic. So um, we isolated RNA and uh, on monocyte-derived uh, human disease, we tested out and measured inflammation. And what we found is that uh, uh, RNA here in uh, purple, uh, what was in vitro transcribed, generated a lot of TNF alpha, and it was all RNA related because when we when we digested with RNAs, it all disappeared. So the RNA was immunogenic, but we found that uh, those other RNA which we isolated back, it was not as immunogenic, and uh, surprisingly, the tRNA was not immunogenic at all. And so we were wondering why tRNA is not immunogenic. And uh, if we look at there, we know that uh, tRNA is uh, highly uh, modified. 
it contains a lot of modified nucleosides, all of them, which is pink and red here in this uh, picture. And so he gave the idea that maybe these modification, maybe these are responsible for uh, lack of immunogenicity of the tRNA. So when we replotted uh, this same uh, uh, graph here, we could see clearly that those which uh, had no modification, this was the in vitro transcribe RNA, it um, uh, generated, uh, it uh, induced a lot of TNF alpha, while those which had uh, the most, uh, uh, like the tRNA, was not immunogenic. So we were wondering, sorry, we were wondering about that how we could make this in vitro transcribe RNA to be non-immunogenic and uh, introduce um, modification. And so for this one, we looked at that how, what we know about uh, modification. And so you have to know that all of the RNA, whether it is messenger or tRNA or whatever, small nuclear RNA, all of them is made from the basic four nucleotides. But to post transcriptionally, modification are introduced. And uh, right now we know more than 100 different type of modification. And these are part of the RNA maturation process. There are more modification because oxidative stress uh, can uh, generate uh, and modify the nucleosides or different kind of alkylating agent. But uh, we are talking about just those which is natural process. And uh, some of them is generated by isomerization or methylation. And um, at that time, we are here in uh, it's about uh, between 2000 and 2004, the uh, enzyme or how these modifications occurred, not only uh, the enzymes were not available, it was not known. And um, so the modification, as you can see on the left, can happen in the, in the, the base, and on the sugar or methylation, this is showing for the pyrimidine and the other is the purine. So this is a lot of different modification and very complex. And how could we introduce this uh, to our uh, in vitro transcribed RNA? So uh, we wonder about, and we decided that uh, since the enzymes are not known that probably we have to purchase something and try to see that whether the T7 RNA polymerase would incorporate. And, um, we finally, we purchased, uh, which was available, these naturally occurring modified nucleosides. It was a uh, triphosphate, and these were 10 different uh, triphosphates which was available. I insisted at that time that we, although a lot of uh, unnaturally occurring modified nucleoside is also available in triphosphate form, but I remember in 1993 reading about the fialuridine trial, which was introduced this modified nucleoside for uh, hepatitis B, uh, and uh, to treat that, and uh, uh, the 10, 15 volunteer, uh, five of them died. And um, they, at that point, you know, we are in 2004, it was not known the reason why, why this uh, modified nucleoside is so toxic, whereas uh, when they tested out thousand times higher dose in rats and even in monkeys, that they couldn't find any, any kind of uh, toxicity. So actually in 2006, when finally the answer came and turned out that uh, nucleoside transporters and only the human nucleoside, equilibrative nucleoside transporter in the middle of the coding sequence has a mitochondrial targeting signal. And what happens is that in the case of human, all of this modified nucleoside pump into the mitochondria. And then the patient lost, you know, the kidney, the liver, and, uh, and died. So I insisted that uh, it, when we do mRNA, we will never ever use any kind of uh, unnatural because that unnatural nucleoside, because our body only knows the natural one, how to get rid of and will not re-enter with a different kind of transporter. I might just mention here that in addition to equilibrative, there are concentrative transporter and all of them have several alternative variants. So what we did, uh, we tried to incorporate these uh, nucleotide triphosphate and generate the RNA, not how nature generated, but how we could generate. And uh, from the 10, five of them did incorporate it by the T7 polymerase. In this experiment, uh, we uh, changed the uh, corresponding uh, uh, nucleotide transport with the natural 
with the modified one. And so in all of these uh, uh, RNA, uh, all of the labeled uh, nucleotides were modified. And then we uh, test it out to see that uh, whether or not they, these are, um, uh, will be uh, immunogenic or not. So in this experiment, first, uh, because my, by 2004, it was known uh, that TLR3 was activated by double-stranded RNA. So we generated uh, stable transformed HEC293 cells. And what we found is that um, when we uh, generated toll-like receptor 7 and toll-like receptor 8 over expressing HEC cells, we found that uh, the unmodified uh, uh, RNA induced high level of IL-8. This is another uh, RNA what we generated. And uh, when we did introduce these different modification, we get a much lower uh, IL-8 induction. So subsequently, we did um, trans uh, test it out whether it is true for uh, primary human dendritic cells. So again, the same RNA we tested out in primary cells. And what we found is that only those which had the uridine was modified, those uh, did not induce any TNF alpha. So now that the other modification did not uh, influence the immunogenicity. So why, why, it is, uh, why it is uridine? What, what is so special about why nature selected to recognize foreignness in an RNA by uh, uh, uridine? So this was uh, the question. And, and so indeed we could see that um, when we had pseudouridine, 5 methyluridine thiouridine, you know, they, we could get uh, no uh, uh, immune response. I wonder about that, uh, why people could not see it. Why scientists did not realize that uridine is such a foreign. So I like to go back and read all the papers. And so I went back all the way to 1963 and I realized that actually scientists knew that at that time. Could, because what happened is that um, Isaac, who actually 1957, he discovered interferon. He did an experiment and he isolated the uh, RNA from mammalian cell and he put on cells and realized that uh, there is no um, interferon was induced. But when he treated uh, that RNA with nitrous acid, he found that uh, the RNA became foreign, how he said that, and it was now induced high level of interferon. And uh, what this uh, nitrous acid is doing, it converts the, urat the cytosine to uracil. So when he had an RNA, for example, just he's showing a sequence, the treatment resulted that all of the C could be converted to U because delamination occurring. And so uh, he also mentioned that how much percentage of cyt cytosine had to be changed to uh, uracil. So actually a scientist in 63 already suspected, <laughs> but they didn't know. So uh, when uh, we did uh, this uh, uh, recognition that uh, uridine is uh, so critical for activating immune, <laughs> immune uh, sensors, uh, later in the crystal structure of toll-like receptor seven and toll-like receptor eight, they identified that uridine containing RNA as well as um, uridine, the nucleoside by itself, can uh, dimerize uh, toll-like receptor A. And uh, only uridine fits right to, the, to this uh, uh, crystal structure interacting with the different amino acid. And most likely when it is modified is uh, not fitting there. So of course now we are happy that we have uh, uh, uridine, modified uridine containing RNA is not uh, uh, immunogenic, but we have to see that whether it is translating because after all, we want to make therapeutic protein, thera mRNA coding for therapeutic protein. Uh, when we tested out, we were surprised to find that um, when we tested in 293 cells, for example, uh, Pseudouridine containing RNA translated so much better than the unmodified RNA. Some which was uh, modified didn't translate it at all. Why um, also we found that in the murine dendritic cells, we found that this pseudouridine containing RNA translates so well. Here I just show you that the uridine and pseudouridine, when people are saying that it is chemically modified, it is really not chemically modified because um, uh, uridine and pseudouridine, 
both of them has the same base, uracil. It is just linked differently to the, to the sugar. So, and the weight is the same. And that was the reason maybe that when we are here in 2008, this was not known at all that uh, messenger RNA actually has a, a pseudouridin. Now we, today we already know and know the enzymes that uh, can uh, incorporate. So uh, we also were interested uh, whether it is uh, translatable in vivo. And again, the uh, formulation was critical. As I mentioned, the lipofectin was important for uh, delivering mRNA to the cultured cells. Now that uh, tra transit uh, was important and other complexing agent to deliver in vivo to mice. And uh, as you can see, when we injected uh, the recombinant protein, EPO to the uh, animal, it is, uh, it is a half-life is about two hours. So the injected protein uh, quickly disappears. When we had uh, the blue shows the ur uridine containing RNA, then uh, we get, uh, uh, we get uh, 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 translation is shorter. And when we had uh, the uh, pseudo-uridine containing uh, uh, mRNA coding for erythropoietin, and here is a very small amount was injected to the animal, and up to four days uh, translation was detected. Um, EPO could be detected in the blood, and most importantly, uh, the uh, animal did not uh, generate any interferon in response to the injected mRNA, whereas the U-containing uh, RNA induced uh, uh, interferon. So it is very important now that we have a pseudouridine containing RNA, which translates very well, and which is uh, not immunogenic. It is uh, like the uh, dream comes through. And uh, so uh, the next, uh, after 2012, uh, yeah, so that I, uh, so an important part was actually to show the, uh, sorry. I should learn to handle more. Okay, so the important part was that uh, the EPO was also functional. We could see that um, hematocrit uh, increased even after injecting once uh, the mRNA and repeated injection, we could see a weekly injection of uh, EPO mRNA uh, maintained hematocrit high level. Uh, what happened after this, uh, um, after 2012, we further uh, optimized um, the mRNA. It is uh, very important to mention that um, uh, in the last 20 years, you know, it will became available that we can uh, just order and the gene can be synthesized. So let's say the um, uh, COVID uh, pandemic has happened 20 years ago, uh, all of those who try to develop vaccine had to be uh, maintained and, and, and obtain uh, some material which contains the virus. But uh, today it was uh, sufficient just to get the information and the gene could be synthesized. It could be incorporated whether into the plasmid or whether it just used as a PCR template. Transcription can be made and many improvements were performed like uh, cap structure were <clears throat> uh, introduced now as a cap one, which is, uh, uh, improve uh, greatly the translation and uh, uh, coding sequence uh, optimization. And so here, for example, the Y type uh, RNA with uh, codon optimization could be uh, increased the translation. And uh, for this one, I would show you that uh, 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 what kind of way we can uh, optimize the coding sequence and how it can change the immunogenicity of the RNA. So when we um, introduce a pseudo modified RNA, we can eliminate all of the immunogenicity. If, uh, if we, um, um, let's say, make the RNA GC rich, then um, some of the uh, code, we can uh, uh, change it and um, uh, the uridine to uh, C or G, but actually not all of the uh, amino acid uh, can be coded by uh, code that has no uridine. And the right I am showing you here that which are those amino acids and what is their frequency in vertebrate that requires uridine in the uh, present uh, to the code. So what it means that um, uh, when uh, somebody is trying to reduce immunogenicity 
of the mRNA by making it GC rich, it will be greatly depend on the amino acid com uh, composition of the target uh, uh, protein. So um, it might be that uh, if it is a uh, leucine rich, then uh, it will be difficult to make non-immunogenic that uh, uh, RNA. In addition, the codon optimization, the other uh, sequence, other A part of the uh, RNA, the UTRs can be optimized. And of course, it was a great uh, enhancement uh, of translation if the RNA is uh, purified. I don't want to talk about it, but again, like uh, we spent like five years trying to figure out how to uh, purify um, the RNA to make it uh, now that finally remove all of the double stranded RNA. And so eventually the uh, uh, RNA will not activate to like receptors free. So here we now that in uh, uh, 2021 and we can make a optimal uh, mRNA with uh, the optimal cap and uh, already clinical trials are ongoing. So uh, those who were not uh, engaged in the messenger RNA field, they thought that maybe this um, uh, first uh, mRNA, which went to a human trial was uh, the vaccine, but actually there are already phase two trial is ongoing to uh, use a VGFA mRNA in a heart failure patient. In addition, uh, cancer uh, uh, treatment with intratumoral injection of cytokine mRNA. Again, these are uh, uh, protein replacement therapies because the mRNA code for a therapeutic protein. And in addition for uh, passive um, immunization when messenger RNA uh, coding for monoclonal antibodies uh, targeting for a viral protein. So these are already clinical trial, which are ongoing with a nucleoside modified RNA in a, a protein replacement field. But, and, and, and we as, and BioNTech also contributed to this uh, uh, and um, our pro program generating bispecific antibodies, which uh, one part is recognizing the immune cells, the other is the uh, cancer cells already uh, moving to clinical phase. Uh, we generated these uh, uh, messenger RNA and uh, tested out in, in mice and showing that, uh, showing that uh, 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 the tumor uh, could be reduced uh, greatly. Uh, in animals that were treated with these bispecific uh, antibody encoding mRNA. Uh, so many uh, protein replacement therapy is in, uh, is in a phase of preclinical stage. Those are uh, mRNA encoding for secreted proteins. And those are kind of uh, easier because uh, any kind of cells uh, may be able to make the protein of interest. So the mRNA can be translated to functional protein. And these are for uh, regeneration and uh, uh, healing of uh, bone or, or uh, injury of the skin or um, treating the uh, anemia with EPO, I just show you. And um, the other part is uh, when mRNA encoding intracellular protein. Those are much more challenging because in that case, the mRNA had to enter to the, uh, to the cell, which requires the uh, missing protein or protein which has a lower level. And uh, so again, we will see in the future that um, the uh, most important part would be again, the formulation. I told you first was the lipofectin, which uh, made it possible to work in culture cells. Then it was the transit, which um, we have, which helped us uh, to investigate the mRNA translation in, in vivo, in animals, and know that we are uh, needing uh, kind of uh, formulation with, which can target specific uh, cell types so that uh, all of the intracellular protein can be introduced. Uh, of course, you know, all of uh, my uh, primary goal was uh, during these years is to develop mRNA for uh, uh, therapy. Therapy where mRNA code for a, a protein that is beneficial and not an antigen. But uh, how we get there, I 
have to show you here my colleague Norbert Pardi at UPenn, who came there to uh, 2011, and we started to work together. And later, he uh, kept working uh, further with uh, Drew Weissman. And uh, what he did uh, is uh, that um, he generated an mRNA coding for uh, uh, pre-membrane envelope uh, glycoprotein, and uh, this uh, he introduced this uh, LMP formulation. And um, this uh, experiment uh, was uh, done in um, 2017 and reported that um, uh, nucleoside modified mRNA uh, formulated with LMP can uh, protect uh, mo even monkeys in very small dose against the Zika viral challenge. And um, the importance uh, uh, was that um, know that even for the uh, vaccine, uh, nucleoside modified RNA was working better. And subsequent work he demonstrated and compared with the U-containing and pseudouridin containing RNA differences in the vaccination, identified a different kind of uh, molecule, the follicular helper cells uh, role uh, in uh, that process. And um, so that was the first time that uh, in 2017, that uh, messenger RNA, nucleoside modified messenger RNA, were formulated with uh, lipid nanoparticle and uh, used as a vaccine successfully in not just in mice but larger animals. So uh, here you can see that very very small dose, even 50 microgram, was sufficient. I have to emphasize again that uh, when uh, DNA was used primarily that, uh, for a vaccination, it had to be scaled up for uh, animal. So larger animal needed a higher dose, but it turned out that uh, is not case for the RNA. Uh, I might mention here also that uh, the, at present, the Pfizer vaccine has, um, BioNTech Pfizer vaccine has 30 microgram uh, mRNA, uh, and uh, the same dose were needed for mice to pro protect them. So uh, for me, is uh, uh, these are the major timelines, you know, what I can say here. Uh, to you as a summary here, uh, that uh, we the RNA, messenger RNA was discovered in 61. 1984 was the first time that we could synthesize mRNA in vitro. 89 was that lipofectin finally helped us to proceed and deliver mRNA and uh, doing many experiments. And um, in 2000, uh, we realized that mRNA, in vitro transcribe RNA immunogenic. 2005, that the nucleoside modified RNA is not immunogenic. And uh, 2017, as uh, I showed you, LMP, which was uh, containing modified RNA, was uh, used uh, as a vaccine. And uh, now we are, for last year, 2020, we get uh, uh, emergency use authorization approval and uh, and know that the vaccine entered to the... Uh, I am not talking here about the vaccine because uh, our CEO, BioNTech CEO, Ugu Zahin, just gave uh, two lectures uh, very recently, and he is uh, the best person who would talk about the development of the uh, different kind of vaccine, including the uh, BioNTech uh, Pfizer vaccine. So please... Uh, listen to his presentation and uh, learn from it. I just would like to finally acknowledge my colleagues at the uh, University of Pennsylvania, who, um, you know, at cardiology, that uh, Elliot Barnaton, who believed me, and then who we together started to uh, perform uh, mRNA therapy at the beginning. At the uh, neurosurgery, David Langer, who managed to save my program by convincing uh, chairman, neurosurgery chairman, to open a lab in neurosurgery for, for a molecular biology. And this is the first time that I had my own lab and a salary. And, um, and of course, you know that uh, uh, Drew Weissman and uh, Norbert Pardi, whom I work together and even today, and uh, develop uh, uh, further the modified RNA program. And um, for the bispecific antibodies program, Christiana Stadler and, and Hyatt were uh, 
instrumental. And of course, I am very grateful to Ugur Zahin and Özlem uh, Turesi uh, working at BioNTech and uh, hiring me there and making, uh, providing an opportunity for me to, to do my best and try to bring the messenger RNA to the clinic. And, um, and uh, from Aquitas, you know, the, the Tom Madden, who uh, CEO of Aquitas that uh, formulated the RNA for the vaccines. And uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Katie. This was really, really fascinating to listen to. And thank you so much for reminding all of us to read old papers, not only the new West ones all the time. So I'm gonna give it over to my uh, colleague Sacha here and she will uh, open up the Q&A session. Uh, thank you, Angela. Uh, I am delighted to join our distinguished guest and panelists for this. It's going to be a wonderful discussion. We'll begin our session with questions from our panelists, as well as questions from our audience. Due to the lots of questions on, uh, on the uh, question and answers, we will try to group uh, recurring question themes to address as many as possible. So our first question is from Vice Chancellor Mahapatra. Uh Thanks, Dr. Kariko. It was such a pleasure listening to the detailed uh, presentation you had. So uh, the question that I have is, how do you see the messenger RNA platform shift future research? And are there any specific collaborations that you recommend engaging in order to advance the impact of this uh, approach? So messenger RNA is a therapeutic use, uh, you know, th those people who were not engaged in uh, this field would think that, you know, it is just uh, emerged and only these companies like uh, BioNTech and Moderna is doing. But I have to tell you that there are many messenger RNA companies all over the world from uh, Japan and uh, Korea and uh, and. and uh, smaller companies and here in the in US also that is specializing for certain application field. And some of them was emerged as a formulation uh, uh, companies and then they needed RNA. And then when we came together on the mRNA meeting, you know, everybody who is looking for help, whether it is uh, uh, regulatory because they want to enter to the clinic or whether they need a better RNA or better formulation or different one. So that's the meeting when the people are coming together and uh, helping each other. And I have to tell you an interesting thing about this uh, field because uh, there is a lot of competition. There are CureVac, which was the first uh, mRNA company, uh, BioNTech and uh, Moderna, but we are also rooting for each other because uh, any failure would be detrimental for all of the mRNA programs. So we are uh, make sure that everybody is, uh, all of these companies are successful. So it is a very unique situation, but um, uh, the platform, so uh, uh, at, at present, you know, the modified RNA is um, used by, uh, by uh, BioNTech and, uh, and Moderna and other companies like uh, Translate Bio and uh, CureVac, they are using unmodified uh, RNA for different uh, application, not just for vaccine, but uh, also for uh, uh, protein replacement therapies. Thank you, Katie. Um, the second question is from uh, Dean Brashear. Thank you so much. Um, uh, Dr. Carrico, as a woman scientist and leader, there have, um, I'm sure, been many challenges that you've faced and have uh, indeed overcome. Um, really, uh, what advice would you give for women in science, uh, particularly STEM researchers, um, and what perhaps is the biggest challenge that you had to overcome? Yeah, so so I, I as, as a woman, uh, you know, in, here in the U.S., I more felt because my have have accent, and then you know I start to learn only in in a university in English. So sometimes it was asked a question, you know, that who is my supervisor? Because when I presented the modified RNA program, 
some assumption was that uh, probably somebody smarter than me has to know all of these things. But, um, you know, the, the thing is that, you know, what I can suggest that don't bother by comments or something that focus, focus on the science as much as you can mm -hmm. and, um, and do what, uh, you know, what you can do. And uh, I also mentioned before when we chat here that um, uh, many times it is uh, very discouraging for people seeing that uh, around them that, you know, they, people who work less and earn more and that they advance and uh, somehow if you focus on your own stuff and then try to not to bother by these things, you know, that uh, sooner or later, you know, your advancing science will pay off and then eventually it will be turn out fine. And uh, of course it is difficult for a woman because they had to give birth, they had to be pregnant, you know, what, if they want to. And uh, so, uh, so that uh, the help from a husband is uh, good because I also <laughs> have uh, get a lot of help from my husband who, you know, didn't uh, want me to be sit to be in the kitchen and cook. And he, he agreed that if I go at the weekend, you know, and even coming back with a PCR machine that didn't close the lid and he had to fix it, he didn't complain, but he had. So everybody's help is <laughs> needed, but yes, so. I don't know that, yeah, so, so I, I don't know that uh, why, you know, girls would be uh, less uh, interested maybe in the science, but I, I think that they are, everybody is interested. Everybody likes flowers, birds, and, and in some level, everybody would like to know something like, you know, when the birds are migrating, where they are going, how they find that, you know, and then at different level, if uh, the teachers would keep the interest of the children, then, uh, you know, would be more scientists and we need more scientists because now you can see that the mRNA will be entering in many, many different area of uh, therapy and we need uh, the next generation of scientists to come. And also the women look at, uh, you know, different and the women can be multitasking, can do so many things. So it would be great in the workforce if uh, women and the men would be, you know, working together on different projects. Okay, the actually next question is from me. So when there are new ideas and new concepts that are ahead of their times and they are not readily appreciated or accepted by peers, reviewers, NIH reviewers and funding agencies, and you are well experienced with these challenges, uh, what are your suggestions or advice to those researchers who are navigating the same situation? You, you know that the one we didn't, I couldn't receive the funding with Elliot uh, Barnett and we went out for venture capitalist. We presented to them, you know, I don't name them because now that maybe, you know, they kicking that what that they didn't help us. And it was 1993 and very small amount, actually it was 70,000 they promised, but you never delivered. So that, um, you know, we tried that. And I realized one thing that, um, you know, our, education did not include all of these different skills. So for example, as, as, as to be a salesman, you know, I, I just wonder that uh, uh, Stefan Banzer, you know, he was a salesman and he was so good and he did a great thing for the mRNA research because he could uh, uh, invite a lot of money, you know, uh, AstraZeneca get 240 million. That was the biggest mRNA, you know, kind of get. And so we need other skills. And, and I, I didn't have that. Probably when I presented, I, as a scientist, you know, when try to get money and or explaining to others, this was not articulated well. Uh, once I remember when uh, on the I, IP office at, uh, at Penn, you know, when finally they asked what is good for, I, I told uh, the guy there who didn't have hair that probably mRNA is good to grow hair. And then he was immediately excited. It was the only time I was, you know, I was a little bit the salesperson, but um, so that, uh, and the language, you know, that uh, 
I, I don't blame the people that didn't give the money. Probably, you know, it was too risky and the kind of the funding is going to science, which is kind of half established or well established and not something that, and maybe 99% is not fundable, the really crazy idea. And, or maybe we have to decide that, uh, fund all of the hundred because maybe one will be the great one. <laughs> I, I don't know because you can see that I tried many things. I tried to establish the company, but uh, you know I couldn't get the pet, my own patent uh, couldn't get with the Drew Weissman, we couldn't get for our company. So, you know, try to ask other people, try to ask the government and others. So, <laughs> so that's uh, difficult. It was very yes, I, yeah, thank you, Katie. This is, um, this is very encouraging and also actually it answers um, Dean uh, Lermore's question regarding persistence and how, how you overcome, how you overcame uh, these odds and, and what you would suggest for up and coming um, scientists in regards to persistence, how, how they could persist. But I think it, it's been um, very helpful. Um, anything else, if, if you wanted to add in regards to how a person, how a scientist can persist um, in facing failures all the time? Yeah, so success, they say that you don't get until you get a failure because successful will be get that you can get, get over on that. And uh, so for me, I was, um, you know, everybody's saying no, 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 but not everybody, because as long as I had one person who, who was for it, you know, and could get enough money. I mean, my salary was meager and uh, was like the technician get more, but if you focus and you do not interest about that, then you can stay on course. And uh, I have to tell you also that it is important to see progress. So I don't say that you just keep doing something and uh, without not seeing some kind of uh, positive outcome, because then it would be, you know, it, uh, it is just a waste of your time. So it was important uh, for us that we could see that, okay, now we can get uh, more translation and uh, we could see um, uh, progress that now we could see on, 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 on animal, and we could see the function, and then we could uh, imagine more and more application. Actually, it was always there that, oh, it will be good for something. At the beginning, when we could do only ex vivo, we focused on, you know, treating a blood vessel for, you know, bypass surgeries, because that's what my colleague, uh, uh, Elliot, was a cardiologist, and they were doing, so that I could have a blood vessel and human blood vessel in my hands, and then uh, we flush through the RNA, it is enough that uh, one minute is going through the liquid already the RNA is picked up and in uh, you know 10 minutes you already can see the protein so it is instant and so we just have to figure out which kind of um, protein that mRNA had to code which would make these uh, vessels more uh, patent and would stay you know and uh, survive longer and um, we also uh, proposed and visited other colleagues uh, at uh, campus uh, with uh, Drew Weissman. We tried to increase, um, for example, the uh, bone marrow half-life by uh, extending the tip of the chromosome, meaning that um, you can apply less uh, uh, bone marrow for one person and would be more people could get it or older people could give uh, bone marrow because now that we are extending the tip of the chromosome and then it would be, so we tried to Constantly, it is kind of you have the button and try to find the code because you 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 have the RNA and now that you try to find what is good for. Of course, you know when it is the therapeutic window is very narrow. I wouldn't suggest that. But in the 24 years at University of Pennsylvania, I attended twice a week for a lecture, excellent lecture. And uh, I also went prepared. And then at the end, I always, if I could feel that it is good for mRNA, this kind of uh, treatment, I, I made the list. And uh, so I arrived at, uh, at BioNTech with, uh, with a 30 proposal. That's 30 different 
And at mm -hmm. present, we are not doing this because we had to do other things. You know, for two years I was spending there, trying to see that what we could do at the bench, how we could uh, upscale, because then we had to find other technology and other. So it went, and then we had to uh, develop programs which we could get the funding for again. So even in the company, but maybe now that things change and uh, we maybe uh, go back and then we see that uh, all of these, including, you know, getting hair growth. <laughs> okay, good message. Write 30 proposals and don't, uh, don't get disheartened. So I love it, thank you. And now um, I have a few um, science related questions that I am trying to lump together. Um, so one question, actually the very first question was um, similar to, to what I wanted to ask. Um, it's kind of um, interesting that still in um, younger children, um, mRNA um, vaccine is not, um, not well um, uh, researched. And, um, and I was wondering if there is any age related difference and if, if you noticed, um, anything um, between um, young and old um, subjects, how they would respond to repeated um, mRNA uh, therapy. Also, it is, um, it is a similar question to what I got from um, my colleague who is actually calling in from Beirut, Lebanon, Carla Irani. Um, she was um, wondering um, how um, you could optimize on um, mRNA uh, related therapy um, to avoid non-specific immunity, but still evoke the kind of immunity that, that you want. So you are not talking about vaccine now, you are talking about therapeutic, so, um, because I mean, the one for therapeutic, uh, many of the diseases, rare diseases, uh, you need to apply for very early age, you know, the newborn had to be treated right away. But you know that you cannot uh, uh, use any kind of mRNA or any other drug before you have to try out an adult, and then you have to scale back and you uh, look at the younger and younger before you apply uh, for the newborn, let's say, for uh, several uh, rare diseases. And um, so this is a big challenge, and also a big challenge that some of the rare diseases are ultra rare, or you, you know it is hard to find. Uh, uh, patient and uh, um, but uh, we we are also have program and we are working on rare diseases and actually again when I went to Germany at the last time I took a deep breath and then wrote one more time in my life a grant because uh, totally I received only once as a company grant and that was for uh, dystrophic epidermolysis bullosa I felt so passionate about those and. Uh, Again, I did not get the grant, but uh, we, uh, you know, I, I am still want to use this uh, messenger RNA because I find it is very applicable and could, uh, you know, the children could benefit from that. So, so that um, uh, for the cl clinical to vaccination related, uh, uh, you know, the uh, Pfizer already, uh, testing uh, between age 12 and 15 already that uh, was closed uh, this uh, trial already. And, and now it is recruiting for the between, I think it was five to, to 11 or something. So it will be come. So it is, uh, you know, when the people are saying that uh, it was pregnant woman who was not, it is natural that uh, any kind of uh, drug when they are testing out, you know, they are never the first line to test out a pregnant woman, you know, that will be usually the last one. So it is obvious that first, you know, and here had to first, uh, try, the trial also went on, you know, the elderly because they were the most vulnerable. And, uh, and so the, those, will, those will come, it will just take uh, more time. I understand. There were a couple of um, uh, questions related to, to the chemical um, modifications. And um, uh, one of the first one was asking the um where was this, um, uh, this toxic version uh, found originally? Um, was it found in nature or it's a synthetic uh, material? And the, the other one was related to the, the thiol 
atoms in, um, in some of the nucleosides and how would those be affected by in vitro modifications, uh, manipulations such as um, use of DTT. Okay, so um, actually uh, I work at the uh, Tampa University and um, my supervisor, Professor Suhadonik wrote the book uh, on uh, the textbook on uh, modified nucleosides. So, and uh, if I say that my uh, uh, PhD thesis, uh, I, I use modified nucleosides, those were uh, cordycepine. Those are naturally occurring, but uh, it was occurring in uh, fungus. And, uh, you know, and those were, uh, you know, uh, uh, three prime deoxyadenosine. And uh, so uh, there are uh, many naturally occurring, but occurring in bacteria or fungus. And um, for the fialuridin, uh, best of my knowledge, it was not naturally occurring. It was, uh, you know, the iodinated and, and the ribo uh, was uh, fluorinated and nature doesn't have, the only sugar modification in nature is the methylation. Two prime methylation is the only one. So it is not natural. It is just um, uh, what was, um, uh, already known that all of these uh, unnatural modified nucleosides is, is uh, antiviral component. And even some of the natural, which is uh, present in bacteria, uh, coformycin and others, they are using against uh, 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 treating of cancer, treating of uh, viral uh, infection, you know, that uh, because uh, they are incorporating to the uh, growing chain and then it chain terminators and uh, inhibiting cell proliferation. So, so those different kind of, whether it is uh, present in naturally in some kind of uh, uh, small other organism that mammalian. So it is important also for us to know that pseudouridine which is uh, our fifth most abundant uh, um, modified nucleoside in our body. Uh, we, we know our body knows how to handle and we cannot uh, break the carb, uh, you know, the uh, glycosylic link linkage to the carbon so that actually we pee out pseudouridine. And, but uh, it is not coming back, it cannot come back because the nucleoside transporters make sure that it is just one way way out. And uh, so that's why it is critical. And this understanding is actually just ongoing. And, you know, when, when somebody is um, using like mRNA for therapy, we had to figure out uh, the translation, what is required for translation, what we know. Now we are taking from outside the mRNA, we have to know that all of this, uh, what we are uh, potential uh, uh, sensors, not just in the endosome, but even in the cytoplasma is there. Then we have to know that how the RNA, what will be the fate, how it degrades, how it will dispose. So, um, and the, you know, all of these nucleoside transporters, so, so many, many, uh, other things we have to know to make sure that uh, everything will be safe. And um, so that was I at the beginning, uh, I, I insisted because more uh, modified nucleoside triphosphate was available, which was not naturally occurring. And I didn't want to use any of them. So almost to extend on that kind of questioning, there is one question uh, in the chat. Uh, about RNA viruses, they do induce strong inflammatory response and, and many of them dampen the immune response. And uh, uh, any comments on that, how the RNA gets modified or how that is used in these situations? So actually the modification, uh, nucleoside modification, the heydays were in the 70s. When uh, 1975, the cap was discovered and they set, found that the, uh, the uh, M7G is there. They, they thought that, oh, this, uh, these, there are modifications here. And, uh, and then they looked at there and they found also that, uh, for example, M6A present in the messenger RNA and other place. So when they looked at there, people realized, you know, the scientists that actually very specific position and it was also when they discovered in the ribosomal RNA, very specific position was a modification. And they thought that if it is so specific, it must be important. So they changed it. And when it changed, nothing happened. There were no phenotype. So you could see that the 70s, you know, so many publication and modification, nucleoside modification, and then after nothing, because there were no phenotype. 
So I looked at the back again, you know, like to see that why they didn't see it. So one of the interesting thing was when, uh, for example, uh, M6A or an other modification was present in the, and then the uh, scientists changed the sequence so that it's still coded for, you know, the virus, everything, but now that the modification couldn't be incorporated, they checked out on the, on the culture cells. They, if they would have looked at animal, then they would see that now that there are there is a difference because the modified RNA would be, you know, uh, less immunogenic and it would be more virulent in the animal. But they 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 couldn't see because they were tested out on cell. So I try to see, just like I mentioned, just for the sake of it, you know, that looking back is why they didn't see that. Did they see that? And then it was the same when I looked at their scientists that uh, Johns Hopkins already changed, but they did not inject it back to the animal the virus and that's why they couldn't see so the virus is using modification the corona has a nucleoside modification that's that's a, a trick to hide you know uh, that is a fascinating point you have brought about the in vitro cell culture based testing and then in vivo, mm -hmm. uh, because in the context of immune system and how response takes place and corrections take place, which you can't see in cell culture that's great point. Uh, another question is, and which is uh, I had, but there's also one in the chat. Uh, so right now, it's a one candidate vaccine mRNA that's been placed for delivery to the cells. Uh, but maybe you could enhance immunogenicity or enhance the uh, immune response by uh, combining it with a delivery with uh, an immune modulating mRNA or some other ones. So how do you see future and what may be the hurdles for increasing the payload of the, that delivery system and uh, include more mRNAs and deliver and enhance the whole process. Is this uh, possible and what would be the challenges? I mean, if you say 30 microgram RNA is uh, protecting a human being, that's kind of very potent already. But um, you know, uh, what happened is uh, when, uh, and I didn't uh, uh, elaborate it on this one, the messenger RNA is very immunogenic. And why we had to reduce the immunogenicity and how finally in the vaccine also is, is the LMP actually, which is activating the, um, the immune system because the messenger RNA inducing interferon. And this interferon is interfering actually with uh, the immune response from the mm -hmm. follicular T helper cells. So the antibody response will be much lower if uh, we are inducing interferon. And that's what the unmodified mRNA is doing. But if you try to make GC rich, like CureVac is doing, you can reduce the uridine content and you might get less uh, interferon induction. Interferon is good against the virus, but not good for inducing uh, immune response. And when uh, you, you are using the, when the LMP is activating and the uh, work as an adjuvant is not inducing interferon, it's inducing other kind of cytokines, which is critical to get good immune response. So, uh, just to add on to that, uh, uh, can you comment on the advantages of self-amplifying RNA in, compare, in comparison to uh, regular mRNA that you're talking about? This is a question in the chat. Yes, so this is uh, my own private opinion because I uh, work with uh, self-amplifying RNA here at Penn and then it was, uh, it was very good. It is very potent. But, um, you know, one, one problem is that uh, you are not just delivering the mRNA coding for the critical, uh, let's say, antigen coding sequence, but it is also contains uh, 260 kilodalton of replicates which are, uh, you know, that uh, uh, you are reapplying. And re so it is a huge RNA, uh, uh, it's challenging because it's at least uh, 7,000 or longer nucleotide long has to be because it, it the replicative, self-replicative RNA codes for the replicase. And so this is one disadvantage. The other thing is that uh, um, 
it's not working well in the larger animals. That's mm -hmm. what is the problem. As see, we know already that uh, first it was uh, um, uh, Novartis uh, was uh, pursuing, and then it was JSK was uh, doing uh, clinical. We have to see the clinical trial. I haven't seen clinical trial data from, uh, and it was already started last year in uh, Imperial College of London. Robin Shatok uh, team started a, a replicative RNA for COVID-19 vaccine and, uh, and the data are not out. So we don't know the data that why it is not advanced, why it is not published, but maybe it will be out and uh, we will see that it is also good. I uh, have uh, some stuff, but uh, again, this is not shared by BioNTech opinion. We also tested actually in phase one clinical trial, we had self-replicative RNA, uridine containing RNA and uh, pseudouridine, one methyl pseudouridine containing RNA and we proceeded with the modified RNA. I have some questions uh, related to, to toxicity and also uh, several um, people in the audience were wondering about the 30 microgram dose and and how is it possible that it works the same way in a mouse which is a thousand times smaller than um, than a, um, than human and um, um, also um, um, questions are related to the blood brain barrier whether mRNA is capable of of bypassing it and get expressed in the brain and then and it, uh, that, an addition to this is totally unrelated, but still related. We have a plant uh, geneticist, um, Richard Michael Moore in the audience, and he would like to know if mRNA therapy could be used in plants too. Sorry for lumping all these together. <laughs> yes, so uh, last one about uh, plant and RNA. Actually, uh, right now, double-stranded RNA is used uh, in plants. And uh, those are um, uh, very specific. So um, uh, like uh, co the Colorado bug, for example, which is eating the leaves. And so when they spray double-stranded RNA and those RNA actually contains some uh, complementary material, which would uh, interfere with the digestion system of the um, uh, bug. So they are eating and then they cannot grow those kind of uh, bugs, like the uh, insects. So that's uh, actually RNA and that's X, S, X, S, 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 I RNA. Okay, so the, the sequences uh, contains complementary sequences and, and interfering with the digestive system of the insect. And because uh, we are not uh, eating the potato leaves, so it is uh, this is why they are using for the, those plants. And actually in different countries already spraying uh, uh, double-stranded RNA to, to the crop, which, yeah. So that RNA is already there, but um, you know, injecting RNA. So uh, there is a more challenge there because the plant has uh, very thick walls. So uh, it is a cellu cellulose and then it is, uh, you have to penetrate through on that. And uh, so the same way, like with the bacteria is also, you put an RNA, it won't get inside. So, but in a, in protoplast, when you remove the wall, probably you can deliver uh, RNA uh, in plants. Um, right now, I cannot remember that somebody was doing that, but uh, they demonstrated that actually extracellular RNA is circulating in the plant, uh, uh, inside the plant, so naturally but uh, not what uh, therapeutic, but uh, could be used. Uh, what was the, the beside the yes, plant? Yes, uh, the, the other was a blood brain barrier and also yes. the, the so, how come that the 30 microgram works. Yes. So the, the blood brain barrier, these are not going through the, the but uh, recently somebody created a, some, just uh, yesterday I was reading that created a tiny particle which finally and uh, modified it in a way uh, surface had a nucleic acid there that could they demonstrated could uh, go through blood brain barrier but these uh, others one is not not going through it is uh, had to be applied uh, through the skull 
And that's actually, we did a lot in uh, neurosurgery. We delivered uh, uh, intraventricularly and intraticarly. And um, at that time, you know, what we could use is only secreted protein, which was therapeutic uh, because uh, the RNA, even if the particle is there, it won't go through several layers of cells. It is just the surface. So if it is an epithelia lining up the, um, uh, and the, with the CSF is circulating, the um, secreted material can reach certain part of the brain, but uh, that delivering the RNA, it won't go through layers of cells. It is also when you deliver, you know, we did together to the to the lung, you know, it and the mucus, it won't go through. You know, there is no no way that the uh, formulation it gets through. And the thirty microgram, of course, you know that. Um, uh, improving the RNA and uh, making it uh, highly translatable. And uh, so it is um, uh, making that uh, sufficient. I mean, we did a clinical trial and uh, we did higher dose and lower dose, and this was selected. Maybe less is enough, you know, just, uh, uh, and, um, and why, uh, you know, in the mice actually with the uh, Norbert party showed 30 microgram, he showed that one, one injection generated the high dose so that, you know, if you could go higher dose, maybe one injection would be enough. So, but there, uh, for this uh, development of the vaccine, the primary goal was as quickly as possible so that, uh, you know, and that was the reason maybe the, it was the minus 70 Celsius because we had the most experience with it. And, um, and then it needed to generate data to show what happened in minus 20. And I would emphasize that when you keep a LMP mRNA in minus 70 then uh, 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 Celsius, then uh, it can be kept there for years. And when you are minus 20, it is just six months. And it meant that you know you have to throw away uh, your inventory if the uh, expires. So minus seventy still has a big advantage. Thank you. Uh, there is one question from uh, Dr. Bill Murphy, and uh, this is more regarding the mechanism. Maybe is the is this the stability of antigen expression that is what is giving better immune response and boost to immune response using in vitro transcribed RNA as compared to modified one or having to use an adjuvant. So is there a faster clearance and impaired expression? So if you could comment on that. Uh, I did not understand exactly what is the question then. Uh, uh, so uh, does the immunogenicity of in vitro transcribed RNA actually help boost immune yeah. response? Yeah. So I mentioned That's... that if the RNA is immunogenic, it uh, seems that uh, is inducing interferon. And uh, if we have the uridine in it, because it activates TOL7 and primary TOL like receptor 8, and it uh, will induce interferon. And so uh, and uh, we have demonstrated, and others also, that if the interferon was in use, then it uh, interfered with a good uh, uh, high affinity antibody response. So, so that uh, it, you, we have to select the uh, adjuvant, which is not inducing interferon. And that is what is in the LMP is doing. Okay, so that, uh... Another question, this is more related to delivery, is that what are the challenges to deliver mRNA to specific types of cells or the parts of the body? Uh, uh, and how do you see that? Is it possible to deliver this mRNA specifically to some virally infected cells, for example? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. So, so one, one part is, of course, when uh, you are delivering uh, locally, so that if you are try to, you know, have a hair growth, then you are delivering where you need the hair growth, or, you know, intramuscularly that you are injecting in the muscle. Of course, when it is uh, injected IV and you want a specific, uh, whether to go to the lung or the spleen, changing the charge on the particles, the formulating particles, we already demonstrated that it can uh, greatly enhance whether it will go to the spleen or whether it will go to the lung where mostly epithelial cells actually picking up. The other is um, uh, when um, 
scientists uh, uh, like Dan Peer and colleagues, like uh, they are uh, adding antibodies to the surface of uh, the particles and then targeting for specific uh, cell types. So then the uh, LMP uh, RNA were picked up by those cell types. Additionally, scientists, because you know there is no uh, tissue specific promoter, so it mm -hmm. is just the RNA, so that if they want to avoid uh, translation in certain type of cells, if it is known those cells which they try to avoid, what kind of micro RNA is overexpressed, then incorporating to the three prime UTR target sequence for those micro RNA and then the RNA degrade on those type of cells. So this is how you can reach specificity. And, but, uh, you know, formulation also that uh, my colleague Drew Weissman and team, you know, they are doing also targeting uh, like uh, bone marrow, the uh, specific targeting they can do. Mm -hmm. And everything is not the RNA, but uh, the form formulation is. And that's why, you know, the formulation will be uh, so critical because uh, that was uh, um, not just for the targeting, but also when we want to induce immunogenicity, the vaccine, or whether when we want to induce tolerance. Of course, when we want to induce tolerance, the LMP has to be different. It cannot activate mm -hmm. because repeatedly, and the you know, uh, BioNTech team uh, demonstrated in uh, a multiplex sclerosis animal model that repeated uh, presentation without activation could induce tolerance in autoimmune disease. So the mRNA encoding uh, autoantigen, then uh, tolerance can be uh, reached. But then again, the LMP has to be different. The, the lipid cannot activate. So that will be the next uh, big chapter in, uh, in our science is that to the development of better and better uh, formulation. Absolutely, that's the importance of the whole delivery system and gene therapy folks always faced with that. So uh, there is one nice question from uh, Priya Shah. Uh, and this is more to do with the challenges uh, faced with scaling up. Uh, so she's asking about uh, the aspects of the scale that you worked on when you first arrived at BioNTech. And can you reflect on some of the more challenging aspects of getting this technology to scale? Yes, so it was uh, from the microgram to go to milligram and then like in the laboratory, we usually just precipitated the RNA. But uh, you know, in the industry, there is no precipitation because the precipitate won't be this tiny something. You will have a, like a tennis ball size of <laughs> precipitate and you cannot put it back to solution. So this precipitation was had to be excluded. It was also, you know, the uh, purification, which we have done on, on uh, uh, HPSC. And it was, uh, there is, you cannot get a bigger column. And so it is, you had to, change the technology, you know, there's just like, you know, they used to say that the light bulb is not coming to improving the candle, you know, you can put a bigger, bigger candle, but you know, finally, uh, you just cannot do it. and that is, uh, so the technology, technology had to be completely different. Now you cannot precipitate, now you cannot do uh, those different uh, purification, how we did, and we had to come up with a new way. And so that's, you uh, uh, that was a little bit frustrating, uh, frustration for me, you know, that uh, we knew what to do and the, the, we could do it, but now that we had to figure out how we can scale up. And this is again, when, when the vaccine is uh, produced that um, um, RNA is not as much uh, difficult to scale up. It is uh, more like a formulation or component of the lipid uh, synthesis and others. And then, uh, you know, for, for people, just um, I mentioned to cooking for two people, you know, it is easy, you steer it and ready. And then tomorrow is 1000 guests is coming. And even if you have the same stove or bigger stove and bigger pot, maybe you cannot steer anymore. And the bottom is burning and up is cold. And, and you have to come up with absolutely different, not, not this way. And then it is when you are doing something, it is very difficult Just okay, forget it. And we have to do somehow differently. So it is, you know, I have so great respect for all of the people working in the industry. Uh, 
that uh, and and um, you know, figuring out in advance and doing all of these things it is just uh, you know fascinating and for this uh, vaccine development all of the my fellow scientists and people at biotech at at uh, um, Pfizer and all of the technical personnel that figuring out in the early on that we have to put more dose in one. We need, uh, you know, figuring out how we would ship. We need a new aeroplane. We need the permission to uh, more CO2 can be shipped on aeroplane. Somebody look at that. Oh, that we don't have permission. We have to go to the aviation. And it's everybody thinking so much ahead, not mentioning all of the clinical trial that how they could work with the hospital un institution like like with it, your institution as well. So it is a so specialist also, so so much respect I have for them. So you brought really a new way of, uh, I mean, you answered about scale up. It's not just simple scale up. You go from two to four or two to 20. You totally have to put a new thinking cap on how to amplify. Angela? Yes, uh, thank you. This, this was... Um, uh, really uh, eye-opening and actually we have a lot of questions regarding that now you put mRNA um, on the map so both for for vaccine which is a very uh, different question scientifically but also for replacement therapies and um, uh, some of the questions are related to the advantages and disadvantages of mRNA versus uh, DNA-related uh, gene therapies. That's for general re gene replacement. Uh, would you um, uh, be able to just briefly um, summarize what would be the advantages and disadvantages one versus the other mm -hmm. and whether mRNA would be more the future rather than um, a DNA in terms of therapy? Mm -hmm. Uh, so, you know, uh, the RNA was always criticized that it is transient, which I always said that this is good. Right now, we could say that, uh, you know, who, who wants to make spike protein rest of their life? And uh, of course, you know, that um, uh, permanent uh, changes can be done also with the mRNA and all of this uh, uh, genome editing, which is uh, ongoing. Uh, they are using uh, for Cas9 and uh, no other Cas9 and other, they are using uh, uh, editing enzyme, which is delivered as an mRNA. So they want to very transiently present there and change the genome. So that uh, even the, the uh, uh, RNA is, uh, we just wrote a preview on, uh, that RNA is fulfilling the promise of the gene therapy, <laughs> because actually uh, permanent changes uh, with uh, together with the uh, um, uh, genome editing we could uh, make permanent. And of course, it is very good, which is many times when they want to use something uh, even gene therapy, they check out whether the RNA with RNA because the RNA will be gone and the effect is gone, and then you can see that whether something is good or not. I mean, the RNA is more like a conventional medicine, and many and many people more likely to have acute disease and um, need uh, transiently some kind of overexpressing thing. And it is also important because if you use this way, you don't have to worry about like um, immunogenicity because if somebody is missing the protein or had a mutated one, you know, it, they might generate immune response against uh, the one that you introduce and secrete it. Of course, if it is not secreted, it's less danger, but if uh, you are introducing, but of course uh, for DNA, is uh, everything is permanent and uh, and uh, when, when my first grant I wrote about the cystic fibrosis, I was reading about that the epithelial cell is turnover is high. So I thought that, oh, if you would permanently introduce a, a DNA into the epithelia and the cell survive is uh, two weeks and gone, then it is also not a, not a permanent, you know, uh, changes, you know, because the cell is gone, then you have to reapply even the DNA. But um, I am sure that um, uh, there is place for, for both of them. And of course the AAV, which is mostly used uh, viral therapy. And, um, but uh, because I focused on so many times on the arguing against them. So all of the argument is coming just <laughs> why the RNA would be better. 
<laughs> but probably there are many uh, good uh, arguments for them also. But I didn't practice that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I understand you're a bit biased, so <laughs> yeah. I, yeah, I totally yeah, agree is. with that. So, but okay, so let me be the devil's advocate here, and and um, several of the questions are related to the adverse um, um, outcomes of of the necessity of repeated administration, um, and also uh, the possibility that even do you carefully modify the RNA, it might still evoke residual innate immune responses. And thirdly, the RNA always would need to be packaged into something to be uh, delivered. So would you care to, um, to comment on that? Yeah, so, so, so the, the dystrophic epidermolysis bulloser, which I mentioned to uh, apply, I found it's very important that um, the repeated application, like for example, to a blister, uh, is, won't be so frequent because the, uh, if it is causing by collagen 7 uh, mutation, the collagen 7 half life is uh, half a year. So you know, months and months, you know, that, and that, uh, that protein had to be there on that uh, uh, layer of uh, cell type. So then uh, can be delivered there and then it will be uh, not so frequent uh, repeated application. I, I understand and I agree that, you know, if uh, weekly or bi-weekly uh, has to be applied that it has a challenge, but um, yes. So if, if the gene can be altered, so with editing, then it would be more feasible and better. Yes. Somebody asked, is phenylketonuria um, being treated mm -hmm. with mRNA yet, if you are aware of it? Yeah, I, I, I am not aware of. Uh, so you know that uh, Moderna had uh, several more uh, program and they terminated some of them. Uh, so it, it is challenging. I understand. And what is the future of, um, of uh, mRNA uh, packaging carriers? How, how are you going to uh, move forward with those challenges? So uh, as I mentioned, on uh, mRNA, uh, is in vitro transcribed mRNA therapy meeting, you know, that uh, the biggest uh, section is, is uh, formulation. So that uh, people are coming up coming up with new ideas and uh, presenting and testing out, trying. And so, um, you know, I mentioned the uh, uh, targeting is a, is a major uh, issue and uh, uh, different kind of uh, ligands uh, are linked to the formulation and try to uh, use this way to in vivo deliver specific cell types. So it is a challenge, but you know, everything is a challenge. <laughs> Yes, you, you did show that um, um, if you can dream it, it's going to be possible when there is a, there is a way, <laughs> there is a will, there is a way. And yeah. actually our last year, this pandemic uh, witnessed this possibility. So um, uh, reinforced our beliefs in, uh, in science. And, and I hope that the standing of scientists in society um, increased as a result. And I know we had many, many more questions, but we are out of time and um, this should conclude um, this uh, Q&A session. And thank you so very much for your time and your effort. And we all are very appreciative. This was a, a wonderful and um, a really eye-opening session. Thank you, Katie. Very grateful. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Please, for uh, and yeah. Uh, yeah. Thanks again. And you know, I, I can just imagine how busy your schedule would be. Um, uh, once again, thank you very much for being with us and sharing your expertise um, uh, so much in detail. And congratulations on all your remarkable achievements and contributions to the society. I also take this opportunity to thank uh, Dean Bressiers, uh, Dr. Haksu, and Dr. Dan Dekker, and to all the audience out there uh, for joining us today. Enjoy the rest of the day. <laughs>